So today we'll be doing some milestones, and then talking about Bacillus cereus and serum tumor markers to end off with, followed by some questions. So just start off with a little developmental milestone quiz. So we have this little baby here for visualization. We're going to call him, I don't know, Baby Jimmy or something like that. <laughs> um, little Jackie. <laughs> little Jackie. <laughs> little Jackie, all right. <laughs> little Jackie. <laughs> And yoga? Yes. <laughs> so, little Jackie is um, apparently constantly being assessed throughout his first five years of life um, on his milestones. So, what will we see within the first year of life, starting with month one? Cooing? Like head lifting? Yes. So the first month is going to be lifting the head up around. And then in the second month. Smiling? Yes. You will see the social smile. And in the third month? Uh, it's a reflex. Mm. Is that the mor moral reflex? Yes. So in the third month, the Moro reflex disappears. And does anyone know what the Moro reflex is? When you like put a baby down, their arms and legs will kind of grasp. They kind of or, flail out like they think yeah. they're falling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like they're trying to grab a tree branch or something. And then in the fourth month? Can they... Uh, I don't want to use the word roll over, but. Um, mm, not yet. No? We have another reflex. First word, bab first babbler. Uh, first word, is it like one year or something? Is it babbling, cooing? Um, it's going to be the rooting reflex disappearing and them oh. being able to oh, orient boy. to voice. You say, hey, little Jackie, it'll turn towards you. <laughs> um, and then at six months, here's where That's you, the roll. That's where you have the roll and some other stuff. Is that the stranger anxiety for this one, too? Yes. So we have stranger anxiety. They can roll and sit. They can also... Um, pass toys between hand to hand, and then their palmer reflex disappears. And then at eight months, Call. yes, Cling. and then at nine months, separation anxiety, separation anxiety, as well as um, object permanence and being able to orient to name and gesture. And then at 10 months. That's the babble? Kind of, yeah. They're able to say a couple words. As well as. Not yet. That's That's a yeah. Is it cruising? Sign motor? No. Standing. 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 They have their pincer grasp. And they can say mama, dada, a few words, little syllables here and there. And then at 12 months um, is the Babinski reflex disappearing. First steps? Uh, yes. It's also when they walk. This is where the cruising comes in. Okay. And they can also point to objects. And 
as we reach the end of the first year of life, does anyone remember the rule for how many cubes they should be, a baby should be able to stack? H times three. All right. So at this point, we've reached one year of life, so we should be able to stack three blocks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're into the second year of life, and by 18 months, little Jackie here should be able to do... Climb stairs. Correct. Climb stairs. And then at 20 months... What do we have? This is between this one and 24. When do they start eating? Feeding? Correct. Right here. Oh. Feeding self with fork and spoon here at 20 months. And then at 24 months, or for us who just like to think two years. Taking a ball? Yep, they can kick a ball. What else? Uh -oh. This is when they can talk a lot more. They uh, do have more words in their vocabulary. Hundred word vocabulary, something like that. But it's two years and two hundred words. They can do other things that involve two. Oh, two like interacting with someone. So they 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 don't interact parallel. with another kid yet, but yes, parallel play. Parallel. They just kind of sit next to another kid to do their own thing while they're doing their own thing. Just think of the two L's in parallel, like two, number two. And uh, two word sentences, and being able to go away from the mother and coming back. And then we hit the third year of life, 36 months. What do we have here? Tricycle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Drawing a circle. Gender? Mm, not yet. Gender, yes. So here. Draw a line? Mm, not yet. Okay. Go ahead. But. <laughs> Those two are fine for now. So, 36 months, you have core, gender, and identity forming. They can ride a tricycle, so they can spend part of the day away from their mom and have now increased their vocabulary up to a thousand words. And the way to remember this is there's three zeros <laughs> in a thousand words, if that works for you. <laughs> and then in the fourth year, now we have... That's the line in circles. Line and circles and a bunch of other stuff, which are friends. <laughs> you make friends in the fourth year. They might be imaginary. But friends in the fourth year. Very good. So yes, they they can do their lines and circles and stick figure drawings here. Um, they have imaginary friends. They also can play cooperatively. How about their um, their verbal skills? Same thousand words. Well, at this point, um, we're thinking about what they can do with those words. Form sentences. Yes. They can form complete sentences with prepositions and can also tell detailed stories. So, little Jackie has, at 36 months, he was able to spend part of the day away from mom. He's going to preschool or whatever, and at four years, he's able to tell mom what he did all day. And then at five years... Where's your shirt? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Self-grooming and they're able to 
button their own buttons and zippers and things. So, that's <laughs> Okay, so make sure you remember this very well because our questions at the end are going to come back to little Jackie here. So, any questions on this before we move on to our next topic? Mm -hmm. Alrighty. So, mm -hmm. now we are on to our friend and foe, the Solus series. And foe. Nobody are is happy to get this. Nobody is happy to get this guy. Alrighty. So, can anyone tell me some characteristics of. Grab positive fraud. And chains. And or like, yeah. Causes food poisoning from rice. Fried rice. Preformed toxin. Okay. Um, is it aerobic or anaerobic? Aerobic. Hey, Aerobic. Aerobic. <laughs> That's a trick question. It is actually kind of both. But I'll get into that <laughs> in a second. Or it's a trick. Or... Tri facultative anaerobe. So it's an aerobe and a facultative anaerobe. This guy's also a motile and beta hemolytic as well. Found in soil and food. And Yash already mentioned it is found in what kind of foods? Rice and pasta. Yes. Fried rice mostly. Chinese fried rice. Reheated. Any fried rice. Does not have to be Chinese fried rice. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, most of the questions you see are Chinese fried rice. Cause of fried rice syndrome, where it's classically contracted from fried rice dishes that have been sitting at room temperature for hours. Um... And this guy also has, um, can produce protective endospores that will allow it to germinate within the rice. And um, it also has virulence factor serolysin and phospholipase C, which contribute to some of the symptoms we get from this guy, which are... Diarrhea. And? Nausea, vomiting. Yes. <laughs> oh, whoa. So. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> so, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And, um, so there are two types of, um, 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 infection. You'll have a diarrheal type and you'll have the emetic form. So with the diarrheal type can be associated with more of a wide range of foods, not necessarily just by the rice cooked. Um, it has a 8 to 16 hour incubation time. Um, it can also be associated with GI pain. And this is the, the longer form of the serious food poisoning. And this version, you want to differentiate from Clostridium perfringens. And um, as far as the timeline for how long it is causing you to be sick. And then the emetic form is more specifically caused by the cooked rice problem there. Um, and here you have the cerulide toxin that um, persists in your reheated rice. It can't be killed by the reheating that goes on there. And here is where you have the nausea and the vomiting that occurs pretty rapidly, one to five hours after eating this food. And then this guy, this form, since it's such a shorter amount of time, you want to be able to distinguish it from staph aureus. And you can diagnose this with, um, seeing the amount of organisms 
um, within the food, but it's not really necessary to do that because this guy is self-limiting. So it'll just unfortunately be sick for a while, less than a day, and then you'll be fine again. Um, and like it says down there, most medic patients recover within 6 to 24 hours. But in some cases, the toxin can be fatal, and this is usually seen in children. Um, there was a case in 2014 where about 20 or so neonates were given food contaminated with B. serious, and they developed septicemia, and three of them ended up dying later, so this can be fatal with severe Alrighty, <laughs> so um, if we go to the next slide, we have a little summary from first aid about this guy, so kind of covered most of this already. Gram positive rod causes food poisoning, spores survive cooking rice. Got the emetic type, diarrheal type, emetic type within one to five hours caused by the cellulite preformed toxin, and then you have the diarrheal type within 8 to 18 hours, and um, this guy known for reheated rice syndrome. Any questions on the Scylla series before we move on to our last topic for today? Cool. Okay. So... Now we get to do a fun little quiz <laughs> on serum tumor markers to test how well we know our shit. Um, Alrighty, so these guys are used to usually monitor tumor recurrence and responses to therapy. Um, not really used for diagnosis, but um, still important to know and see how things are going. Um, these are proteins on um, surface-like receptors or products released from cancer cells and these are important because they help confirm diagnosis and like I said they monitor effectiveness of therapy and check for recurrence. So when we see alkaline phosphatase what sort of things are we thinking about? Looks like tumor. Uh-huh. Pageant. Pageant. Pageant's disease. Yes. And Liver and bone metastasis. Correct. So yes, all of those things. Metastasis to bone or liver, Pageant's disease of the bone, and Greek side tumor, seminomas, all that stuff. Um, and here we, if we have metastasis to the liver, we want to exclude it being from the liver originally by checking our LFTs and that fun stuff. And then we have alpha feed protein, which we see in... This is the yolk sac Yeah, sac I was going to say, I lied. Yeah, I knew it didn't sound right. Yolk sac tumor. <laughs> Hepatocellular carcinoma, neural tube defects, uh, that's all I remember. <laughs> yes, well, that's most of them. Hepatocellular carcinoma, yes, hepatoblastoma, yolk cell, yolk sac mm -hmm. tumor and mixed germ cell tumor. So I have a question. If you have a congenital umbilical hernia, would your AFP be high or low? Or that wouldn't matter? Because isn't that part of a neural tube issue? Um, I think it would be high, because like it says there, are high levels associated with neural tube and abdominal wall defects, and hernia is more of an abdominal wall defect, congenital. Right, because that's a gastrocele or omphalocele. Yeah, which you would see in like patals. You can see that in patals, I believe, and then doesn't patals um, have like an AFP? 
have increased, decreased during the first? It was a question I got asked today, so I wasn't sure. I'm um, looking it up now. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I believe in Patals you can have an abdominal cat bar, is it? Oh. Yeah, in, in Patel's, um, I have read somewhere that it's more, you, they have like, um, abdominal um, or umbilical hernias and in the first trimester, uh, never mind. <laughs> AFP levels are, I don't know if the new book has something different, but maybe normal. Yeah, I don't have any notes on that one. Um, okay, that's that's a but based on what's written here with high levels and abdominal wall defects, I would think so, yeah. Okay. Okay. And then low levels with Down syndrome association. That's also another important one there. And then we have Beta HCG. That's also a yolk sac tumor. Um, Choriocarcinoma. Choriocarcinoma, yes. High to the dog, high to the form mole. Yes. <laughs> yes. So high to the form moles, choriocarcinomas. Testicular cancers. Yes. Testicular cancer and mixed germ cell tumor. Um, this guy normally being produced by the syncytio trophoblasts of the placenta. Um, fun little fact about this guy. I don't know if you guys have seen this um, post going around online about this guy taking one of his girlfriend's pregnancy tests and just trying it out for fun on himself and it's showing up positive and him posting it and people suggesting that he go see his doctor to check for testicular cancer because pregnancy tests look for beta HCG levels and his was obviously high enough for that thing to go off so there's a fun and easy test for and testicular to cancer is seen in younger males right <laughs> yes it's like it's more predominantly seen in like younger ages. Yeah. Which would make sense why <laughs> I thought that was funny to do. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, so now we have C A fifteen or C A twenty seven to twenty nine. Is this guy associated with? Breast cancer. Yes, breast cancer is correct. Oh. And I have CA19. Pancreatic. Yes. Adenocarcinoma. Correct. Pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And we have CA125. Ovarian tumors. Yes, ovarian cancer. And calcitonin. Men. To A and B. B. A and B. Medullary, I think. Yes. Oh. For medullary thyroid carcinoma, so it can either occur alone in that or with the MEN syndromes as well. And then we have CEA. Colorectal and pancreatic are high. That's all I know. There are major associations, and it also has. Couple of minor associations. Breast cancer. Which one? Yeah. I said breast, but I don't think that's right. I know breast is one of them. Ooh. Um, you more think about another system though. Oh, um, kidney, mother, gastric. <laughs> 
So, <laughs> yes, so Ash is right. The colorectal and pancreatic being the major associations um, with the minor associations. Yes, there is breast and medullary thyroid carcinomas as well, but the major one of the minors being gastric. So this guy's kind of a little bit all over the place. It's very non-specific tumor marker here, but still kind of important. Then we have chromogranin, which is associated with lung tumors. Mm -hmm. Neuro endocrine tumors. And then last on our list is PSA. Prostate. Prostate. Prostate cancer, yes. Can also be seen with or evaluated in benign prostatic hyperplasia and prostatitis. If, like, the PSA level is 4.5, because the normal has got to be less than 4, would you say it's BPH or prostate cancer? Or do you base it off of symptoms? Um, you, I think to differentiate those two between BPH and prostate cancer, you'd have to do either a biopsy, a biopsy to get a confirmed diagnosis, because this is just giving you either, like, an assistance to the diagnosis. It's not going to Yeah, I feel like the, the tumor markers pretty much, one, tell you if, like, there are other, what other um, cancers might be related and, like, what could present, what else could present in the patient for, um, like, if it was surgically resected, um, and it's chances of coming back. So whatever form of therapy you choose, I think you can use serum tumor markers to like assess the treatment plan and managing that. Yes. But, and like metastasis. So like if it comes back, then like serum tumor markers can indicate it's reoccurrence and metastasis occurring. Yeah. So there's, there's not really super great or primary for diagnosing, just kind of like, hey, this is an abnormal level, so here are some things that could be possible. I don't think you can really tell at a specific level whether it's BPH or full-blown full blown prostate cancer until you do a biopsy or get in there and visualize it. And, um, yeah, so any questions on this guy before we do some questions? Okay, so we'll start with our first question here. The young boy becomes visibly upset when a physician enters the room. He was holding a block with a mature pincer grasp, but now drops the object. The child's mother reports that he is doing well and is beginning to make sounds that resemble him trying to speak. She also says that he can pull himself up to stand and can walk with help. When the examination begins, the child starts to cry and withdraws further into his mother's lap. The physician notes a mild upgoing Rubinsky reflex. Assuming he has met all developmental milestones normally, how old is this child? See her cat. Okay. Any other answers? Okay, we'll see. All right. Sure. C is correct. So, um, when we think of Babinski reflex, um, we said that occurs when? 12 months. It, yeah, regresses or goes away by 12 months. By 12 months. Um, so, again, with developmental milestones, the timeline's a little bit here and there, but usually by the first year, Give or take a few months, you want to see the Babinski reflex going away. So if you hit one more time, um, generally it should be completely gone by 15 months. And this child is um, has stranger anxiety, um, 
as well as being able to use the pincer grasp. So if we hit one more time, that usually occurs somewhere between seven to nine months is when that starts. So we're looking at that sort of timeline in between seven to nine months and 15 months. And you guys got it, 11 months, smack in between. Any questions about this guy before we do our next question? Okay. Now we have a three-year-old boy brought to the office for a well-child visit. His mother reports that apart from an ear infection last year, he is in good health. Child started preschool this year. He is not able to cooperate with the other kids, but likes to play near them. The patient knows his age and gender and speaks in three-word sentences. He can ride a tricycle, but not a bicycle. The patient does not use a spoon or fork but enjoys eating with his hands. He scribbles spontaneously, but cannot copy a circle. He weighs 32 pounds and is three feet two inches. Head circumference 20 inches. <laughs> Which of the following developmental milestones is likely delayed in this patient? B for boy. Okay, any other answers? Yeah, I'm going with B. B is correct. <laughs> um, the clue here in the stem being that the boy cannot use a spoon or fork or copy a circle, which are fine motor skills that we would want to be able to see at his age of three. And um, other things we'd see at this age where his cognitive skills, gross motor language, and social are obviously there. We can see that within the stem too. He can say his age and gender and follow simple directions, he can climb stairs, ride a tricycle, speak in simple sentences, and he's not able to do cooperative play yet, but he's still okay because he can do other sorts of parallel play and things like that. Any questions on this? I think we have one more question. So. Okay. A two-year-old girl is brought to the office due to concerns about her development. The girl says approximately 40 words and does not string words together. She can jump, walk, upstairs slowly, build a six-block tower, and follow short commands. She feeds and helps to dress herself. The girl's mother says, my daughter is such a happy child. She loves playing with the other kids at daycare. She's affectionate and caring towards us and her dog. I don't know why she won't speak. Her sister was using sentences by age two. Is there something wrong with her? Which of the following is the most appropriate response by the physician? Uh, for Frank. Agreed. F is correct. So her motor and social skills are normal for her age of two years, um, but as far as language, you want to see a bigger vocabulary of up to 200 words, and she's only approximately at 40, and she should be able to say two-word phrases, but apparently she's not able to string words together, so that's a concern. Um, usually kids with an isolated language delay will catch up in preschool. Um, but if um, there is a persistent deficit, then this child could be at risk for writing or reading learning problems as they progress through school. And she should also have a hearing examination as well as speech and language evaluation to make sure that it's there's not other things going on that are impeding her speech. And uh, yeah, any questions about this question? Nope. Alrighty, well, that is all I have for you today. <laughs>